So let's start this session. While the digital technologies are underway and Beryl is installing the USB stick, whatever it should be, uh, in order to use the PowerPoint, uh, the PowerPoint is still part of the digital uh, way of working. I don't know whether, Manfred, it will ever disappear. Uh, maybe they will become virtual in the future. Uh, anyway, um, so waiting for Beryl to, to show up from behind the screen. I think uh, I'm very glad to be able to preside this session. I'm also glad to, uh, to have been able to swap uh, over the past week with uh, Eduardo, who takes up a uh, session this afternoon where I was planned, so I went a little bit earlier. Uh, the digital workplace, you know, is already since a very long time a big debate, a big discussion. And uh, I remember a couple of years, uh, some people know that in the room, we tried to identify the game changers of labor law over the past, let's say, half century. And we came up with a lot of things, uh, but not with endless things. Uh, globalization came up, economic efficiency thinking came up, demography has come up, but of course technology has also been very much in the fore of the things that have influenced our world of work and our labor law discussions. And now, you know, we have this agenda of how do we get away from that sort of strange period that COVID-19 has given us. And a lot of things during COVID-19 have given the thought that we may have to leave behind the things we already knew and start again thinking about certain things in life, but also at work. And also the question has been, during COVID-19 and coming out of this, have we left the knowledge that we knew before it started? Do we look otherwise to the digital world, to digitalization and technology? Do new things show up? And I'm very curious to know. So all the reflections that are going on about digital transformation in the workplace uh, are now being presented. And, and I, I try to see what kind of lessons we learn to combine the digital agenda with the COVID experience. And I'm very glad to give the first uh, floor to Beryl Terhaar, which is who is going to present together with Marta Otto. And Marta is online. Beryl is, well, also online mentally, but physically here. And so, Beryl, I assume I can first give you the floor and you will arrange with Marta in the next coming 15 minutes how you will hybridly work further. Thanks so much. Thank you. So, Marta's going to start, so Good. Marta, if you're with us. Hello, Marta. Yes, I'm just going to do the standard sound check. Uh, it sounds great. I can hear myself. I hear you. Okay, and I can hear myself from the back. We see you. Okay, good. Um, okay, let me start by uh, thanking the organizers to have the chance to contribute to such a wonderful seminar conference, uh, which finally took place in person. I really do regret that I cannot join you in person, although I'm really grateful to uh, Marco Biacci uh, Foundation that they really enabled me high quality online uh, participation and attendance uh, during today's conference. And it's a, a bit of a paradox that we're going to speak today with uh, Barrow about the hybrid, hybrid workforce uh, by being, you know, uh, by using the hybrid connection to the conference. So um, let me start with explaining first uh, why we decided to look at the AI, AI uh, from a bit of different perspective, different angle. So our first thoughts for the paper we are presenting today was that in the current research on AI at the workplace, we tend to focus a lot on the problems it causes and not so much yet on the positive things it is bringing us. So why we generally agree with the concerns about the problems it is causing, like for example, with workers' right to privacy, we started wondering what would happen if we would bring us or where it would bring us when we will follow, when we should uh, focus on how AI can help us to get a more human friendly workplace 
recovery after COVID-19. So, in fact, it made us wonder how AI could contribute to creating a more human-friendly workplace in general. But how to do this? So, our approach is to try to break free from how we look at workplaces now and how they are currently uh, regulated as such. And our research as such is centered upon um, four complementary sub-narratives or four stages. The first one is to reimagine the workplace, especially in terms of a hybrid human AI workforce. Uh, the second stage is to rethink uh, the workplace in terms of what would be needed to make sure that the hybrid human AI workforce will be human friendly. The third stage would be to reshape the regulatory approaches. So if the workforce is fundamentally changing into something that is human AI workforce, a hybrid one, and we want to make sure that this is human friendly, we need to think about what kind of regulatory approach fits best with this. And finally, the, the final stage uh, is to re-regulate. So once we understand what kind of regulatory approach is needed, we can start to think about what that means in concrete regulations for the workforce and of the workforce. <coughs> and I stop here and uh, share the screen and slash pass the floor to Beryl, who will share more, more details with you. Okay. Beryl, the floor is yours. Thank you. So. Reimagine, reshape, rethink, re-regulate, these are really interesting approaches uh, to address the topic, but how can we actually do this? And even though I'm a big fan of like fantasy novels and science fiction and also utopias, we thought we want to do something that is actually more realistic. Um, so that made us search for ideas and research methods in other scientific fields actually, like with this idea of breaking out of what we have been doing so far. So we have been and we are still reading books and articles about the changing world of work written by economists, political economists, social economists, sociologists, anthropologists, management, philosophy and law, historians, labor historians, work historians and labor lawyers, of course, our own field as well. We are also reading policy documents like from the EU, the ILO, the OECD and even some countries. In fact, we're looking at Japan as a nice example. So we're not reading this randomly. So we do this more systematically and based on some theories and approaches. And I will appro uh, elaborate a little bit on the theories and approaches that we uh, take. Uh, firstly, from more from economics and politics. So the first theory, which is already on the screen, is the theory of autoparesis and reflexive law, uh, of which one of our colleagues, uh, Ralf Rogowski, has done a lot of work on. So we found that very inspirational. And the idea here is that law does not operate in a vacuum. Indeed, we all know that it interacts, responds, reflects what is going on in society, or in terms of autoparesis, social subsystems. So when talking about labor law, there is a natural autopoiesis with economics and politics. So, and that runs as follows. The dominant economic system determines what societal values and political ideals need to be protected by policies and laws. As a consequence, economics finds its limitations in those societal values and political ideals, which then are being translated into policies and laws. To make this into a concrete example, for example, the freedom to run a business. Uh, which is an expression of the current dominant economic system, neoliberal free market capitalism. But it is not an absolute freedom, so it can be limited to safeguard societal values and political ideals. So this, inclu and this includes fundamental values of labor law, like social justice, human dignity, equality, capability, freedom of association and collective bargaining. And then we see a number of paradigm shifts. So we see a paradigm shift in economic theories and in political thinking. Uh, and because autoparesis uh, is uh, interesting to see, uh, because of the autoparesis that we take as a starting point, it is interesting to see what discussions and ideas about the future of work, especially in relation to AI as a case study, are discussed in economic, political, sociological, literature, etc. So systemizing it. 
And in this literature, we found these paradigm shifts in the fundamentals of economics and politics. So, and just to elaborate a little bit on paradigms, it comes from social science, so I'm not sure if all lawyers are that familiar with it, although I think most of you actually are. But still, it's a basic fundamental assumption to construct and organize uh, or systemize thinking within a certain area. So it is uh, this changing in one of the fields that law is reflexive to. It means that we need to rethink the role of law on that point. And here we see two paradigm shifts emerging in economic thinking. One shift is away from profits and growth-driven economics towards a more growth-agnostic approach focused on the well-being of people and planet. For example, the Donut Economics by Kate Rowood, which I still thank Sylvia Reinone for, for once pointing me out or leading me to that book. Um, and another shift is moving away a bit from ideals, like uh, free market capitalism or Marxism, uh, towards a more pragmatic, universal values-driven approach, as proposed by Paul Collier. These two paradigm shifts seem to be linked uh, since uh, they put human and planetary needs central. The first by defining the bottom lines of human needs and the second by defining prerequisites to achieve and sustain the universal values for which uh, the minimum needs are more concrete manifestations. We also see paradigm shifts in political thinking. So we, need, we notice a shift away from neoliberal politics in which governments only act when and where it is needed to correct failures of the market towards a more mission-driven approach, which requires proactive, specialized governmental interventions. And here we refer especially to Matsukato's work uh, uh, called Mission Economics. To be able to have more mission-driven politics, the technique of foresight policymaking is needed. And this, in short, is an approach to policy development that goes beyond pure evidence-based, but also combines it with a context and con conceptualization. conceptualizations. And in order to do that, forward looking is needed. It involves scenario planning and visioning and backcasting and techniques that are already applied, for example, by the OECD and increasingly also by the EU. And now I give the floor back to Marta. OK, so uh, to match the paradigm shifts in economic and political thinking, we also suggest the need for a paradigm shift in legal thinking. So, in fact, we, we suggest a double paradigm shift in legal thinking that are linked to each other. Mm, and uh, the first legal paradigm shift is one that moves away from the prevalent in this domain, uh, the so called risk based approach to lawmaking towards a more needs based, purposive approach to lawmaking. The second what follows somehow from a needs-based, purposive approach, which should be based on values. Uh, not ideological values, but universal values, such as the ones uh, we found in socio-economic thinking and with, uh, with a pragmatic approach to the career. So this would mean a paradigm shift in legal thinking, because in current approaches, and though um, what is surprising is that Values are somehow most often presented as elements that are external to the law. With this approach that we are taking, we mean that the values introduced to the system of the law should take on the normative shape of legal principles. So to achieve this, we do concentrate, of course, on ecology of the law. So that is a very complex system of relations between social values and the legal normative system. Or to say this uh, more plainly, the values influence the content and the manner in which legal decisions are taken. And, and we mean both in lawmaking and of course law interpretation. And in this approach, values can have at least four functions. The first one would be normative, which is about determining the content of legal regulations. The second one would be rationalizing, which would be about giving meaning to legal decisions indicating the desired results of their implementation. Um, the third one would be evaluative, uh, which is about criteria for assessing the content and results of it, fulfilling the legal norms. 
And the last one would be interpretive, which would be about determining the direction and scope of interpretation of people uh, norms. And just to be sure, values are not the same as fundamental rights. Although some fundamental rights like true dignity, of course, can be a value. So, so by making this distinction, we want to stress here that based on the lead axiology approach, combined a needs based for a positive approach with a values get a profound and meaningful role. Something which does not really exist in the current legal thinking, in which values are still very much often limited to a mere um, kind of programmatic role. Um, and it's over to you, bro. Let me stop here. Yeah, okay. So then our next question is like, how is this all of this going to work for the creation of a human-friendly, digitalized workplace? And uh, let me stress here, we are very much in an explorative phase for this. So what we share is just our initial ideas. Mm -hmm. um, to start with, the idea of reimagine. So we start with reimagining the digital workplace in which humans and AI work together harmoniously and feeding into each other's strengths. Rather than focusing on particular jobs or tasks, we found an interesting approach in semi-scientific management uh, or more popular scientific management literature in the book that's called Humans Plus Machines by Doherty and Wilson. This scheme on the slide now is uh, actually coming from that. And <clears throat> they are consultants and as part of their work, they collected a lot of examples of how humans, machines, AI currently work together. So this is clearly a form of evidence-based uh, working. They analyzed these collaborations on factors of success and failure, and the result of their analysis was that collaborations that were successful were successful because human and machines complemented each other really perfectly. And this complementation was found in the characteristics that are needed to perform a certain task or job. So it's not really looking at task or job, but characteristics of that. And they also found that many failures or problems were the result of a mismatch of such characteristics. And often, as they found, because there was a lack of knowledge and insight on how humans and machines actually could complement each other in the best way. So with their approach to translate tasks and jobs actually into characteristics that are needed, they conceptualized how a harmonious, well-functioning hybrid workplace could look like. And we use this as our reimagination of the hybrid workplace. About two minutes, uh, Beto? Yeah, that if should be can. kind of okay. Marta? We can't hear you. Your mic is off, I think. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for that. So if we if we can imagine a hybrid workplace where humans and machines, or in our case AI, work somehow harmoniously together, then we can start to rethink. So in our case, this rethinking the fundamental values to to create a human-friendly digital workforce of world of work. And for this, we found the true inspiration in some policy documents coming from uh, the EU's Industry 5.0, which the European Commission introduced to give uh, industry for zero and more human centric dimension. And as such, of course, it is not by the development of industry for zero, but more of a kind of correction uh, to it within which the human factor is back into the center of the workplace and uh, workforce. So, more precisely, what is interesting about this industry five zero uh, concept is, is the perception that this technology should s serve humans and not the other way uh, round. But the question in industry 4.0 should not be what we humans can do with modern technology, but following industry 5.0, what technology can do for us humans. Another truly inspirational policy approach is Japan Society 5.0. And again, the goal here is to realize a society where people enjoy life to the fullest, where it economic growth and technological development exists for that purpose and not for the prosperity of a select few. So in this approach, we may find many ideas that are needs-based. Over to you to wrap it up. Ooh. Yeah. So we have extra time. One minute? So the golden goal, yes. Okay. So reshape. 
um, we <coughs> with our V-shaped regulatory approach as explained as needs-based purposive approach based on values, we can now try to translate this into a more concrete regulatory approach. And here we really just at the very, very, very beginning of our explanation. So the table on this slide gives an idea of our first attempt. And in brief, the idea is not to regulate tasks or jobs, but to take characteristics of tasks or jobs as the regulatory starting point. We link this to the basic values of Paul Collier and try to make a translation uh, the, uh, of those to the value, basic values of labor law. Um, actually, it's the ones of the ILO. Um, and this is really just playing with some ideas, and we don't know yet whether this could be a way forward, but well, it gives us something uh, as a start. And then, uh, well, it doesn't want to respond anymore, so our last slide That's is... That's because the time is up, uh, Ben, yeah, yeah, yeah. program. No, but the AI. this slide is very okay. funny. <laughs> so I want to show it. So we regulate. You know I'm in for fun all the time. We are not there yet, so okay. this is a to be continued. Okay. So thank you. Super. <laughs> Thanks so much uh, for this. I'm going to ask Michele already to come to the fore, while I'll thank uh, again Beryl and Marta for. I think yeah, it's an it's a paper with ideas. I've seen the draft. Uh, it's fantastic. I. I cannot say anymore that it's a helicopter view that's going against climate uh, policy, so it's a bird's eye view on, uh, on labor law and much broader, so thanks so much. And Michele Mole is going to talk with PowerPoint and is going to talk about AI, surveillance, monitoring, and you know, the thing I'm really looking forward is going to explain this. At least he's going to talk about explainability, because I don't have a clue about AI and how I should be able to control it. Dikele, if you have ways to control AI, <laughs> well, tell Frank, us. Frank, I guess you have some ideas, <laughs> but yeah. Go ahead. At least reading. Uh, yeah. Shall I use It should come. I think there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is it working? No. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, my, my paper has a very long title. It's the cast for uh, effective labor rights in the um, European post-pandemic uh, scenario. And my answer for the effectivity of uh, fundamental uh, labor rights today is trying to design explainability and understanding of uh, workplace uh, surveillance, which is a provocative uh, idea. And here I try uh, to uh, pro problematize uh, for some parts uh, the right to privacy as the correct uh, method of um, governance of uh, uh, the actual uh, uh, technological development of uh, surveillance. So I start with this uh, drawing that is not meant to offend your intellectual properties to understand the monitoring power of uh, the employers, but it's, uh, it's just to show that uh, if we have been used so far to a monitoring uh, 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 prerogative uh, um, uh, deriving from an, an employment uh, contract. Uh, so an employer can monitor, of course, for uh, many different uh, purposes, uh, organizational purposes, uh, health and safety, uh, security is also a very, a very important reason. I think that today, uh, nowadays, uh, this is the, the most encompassing view on the monitoring prerogative of employers. That is, uh, em employers are relying, not totally, but for some parts, for some uh, specific uh, features of uh, surveillance on software and, and hardware. So when we point out the growing asymmetries of power and information, and there's a huge uh, literature of uh, brilliant uh, scholars that are also sitting in this, uh, in this room, I, I, I think that uh, we should uh, add more and more uh, uh, the fact that nowadays in corporate uh, structures, we have a third party, uh, 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 an embedded uh, uh, participant 
front, uh, coming from, uh, from, from the outside, that is a, a vast market of companies developing software, uh, constructing uh, hardware, and employers thus are becoming uh, more and more users of this uh, software and, and hardware. We have a few examples of uh, uh, empl big employers uh, developing their, their own uh, monitoring systems, such as Amazon, and this, um, this uh, very uh, striking case on, um, on the news, but I think we should get more used to uh, um, a, um, a small-scale market which is made by military companies uh, um, and other, and, and other uh, software uh, developers that are the real protagonists of this uh, revolution. I think uh, most of you know this very interesting uh, report coming from the US, which is the, li the Little Tech uh, database uh, from uh, uh, coworker.org. I, I think it's the, the and, and I think it's an NGO which is pointing uh, to this that we should care less about, uh, well, we, we, of course, we, uh, we should care about big tech, but we should care also about little tech. So this vast and variegated presence of companies selling software to employers and thus distributing and fragmenting the distribution of information and power within employment. This means that an employer might not be aware that, that AI is uh, discriminating uh, uh, minorities while in a, in, in, a, in a recruiting process and so on. And this is these are things I, I think that uh, as labor lawyer we should consider, not to say that employers are less liable, but it but it it's something that especially under a fundamental rights uh, approach shall shall be addressed. So uh, so this is again uh, I'm stressing again the point. So artificial intelligence as a software and the Internet of Things, meaning all these networks of uh, devices of sensors, are changing. Uh, the uh, how uh, workers are uh, monitored. So more than asking ourselves uh, how can a software can do uh, today, we should address the fact that surveillance is scaling up. Today with a sensor, with a software, you can monitor anything. Uh, anything. Now, we are also discussing like mental uh, uh, mental uh, monitoring, emotional status. So it's not anymore how how much can we scale up, but how much we can scale down. So it's my my question is how can we? Uh, no, my my point is today that we should stress that we are we are now witnessing a structural overexposure of employees under employer and provider scrutiny. So given that we have a new context, a new scenario, how can we imagine an, a, a, a new framework uh, for fundamental um, rights at work? Well, I think that here are coming uh, some, some, some problems from the right to privacy and the right to data protection, uh, which shall be addressed. Um, um, of course, this is, again, I'm not making examples today because I think that I'm rather complementary to the presentation of uh, Tammy, uh, which I hope you were also in the previous panel so you can recall all her examples of software and, and hardware. I hear I mentioned uh, Cogito, which is a, an AI with a sensor that is uh, analyzing your tone of voice while you are working in a call center. So if your tone of voice is not friendly and it's not compliant with the, the customer care policy, customer care policies, you get pop-ups and advices to be more friendly, to please be kind with the client, and so on. Trade union freedoms, we have these examples, we worries, um, worrisome um, examples from, from the US of these um, AI chatbots internal um, to the companies that employees use to communicate uh, with AI moderators that are banning words like unionization, slavery labor, uh, working conditions, and, and so on. This is uh, something happened recently in, um, in April. So there's a major, a major impact of, um, on uh, fundamental freedoms from this structural overexposure of, uh, of uh, employees. So, the, so the, um, uh, the privacy and data protection scholarship has been discussing explainability as a contextual uh, transparency, so giving targeted uh, disclosure and information to employees to make uh, comprehensible to make understandable surveillance and trying us to uh, rebalance this 
this information and power uh, asymmetries. But it, like the debate is not um, uh, unanimous because uh, other, like, well, a minority is also sustaining that we, sh we, we shall have a, um, a universal uh, transparency in order to uh, increase awareness of the public debate. So that means uh, op opening the code, have uh, uh, sharing the technicalities, uh, uh, which of course has uh, some uh, uh, shortcomings uh, towards the recipients because if you give me a code of an algorithm, I wouldn't understand anything from, from that. So we have this clash, this, uh, this clash between, I call it them, uh, ex uh, um, explainability as contextual transparency and understanding as universal transparency. Uh, today, I'm not picking up one of the, uh, nor the black side or the white side, but I'm simply saying that maybe we should address both dimensions, meaning that explainability is, of course, good within the single employment uh, relationship, uh, rebalancing uh, uh, information between the employer and the employee, and understanding it's something that we need as universal uh, transparency to uh, push uh, the, um, the uh, reskilling of trade unions and all the stakeholders that are trying to catch up with all this uh, at technological stuff ongoing at work. But, and here comes my, um, today's I'm serving you to the, my, 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 my uh, uh, provocation. I think that privacy will uh, reveal, privacy, especially privacy, less data protection will reveal itself as a rather a uh, liberal approach toward, uh, against uh, a major social, uh, um, social uh, change in how we manage, in how we organize our businesses. This means that uh, each software, each hardware that uh, employers nowadays can uh, purchase are simply expanding uh, their uh, uh, prerogative. So for some parts we should probably think that it's also changing the freedom to uh, uh, the right to organize uh, a business because uh, businesses no nowadays are uh, relying more on data analytics, on data, and this is all, uh, these are all things that we know. So if we, if we understand that uh, the right to organize a business is expanding under a technological point of view. On the other side, we have uh, privacy, which is a rather relative right. Today, it's incredibly easy to shape privacy according to business needs. Uh, if we, ha if we, can, uh, we can recall the Barbulescu case, which is simply, I think, an exception that proves the rule. That means that uh, today, if you have any security need, if you have any major organizational need, it's easy to, uh, to have to, to, uh, to reduce privacy. And this is, this is uh, also my, 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 my reason for this structural overexposure of uh, employees. So the right to privacy and data protection, it's when we have a pressing so, uh, social need, which is uh, an economical need, a security need, it's, it's, it's easy to be, to be reduced, to, to, to have on, on the other side a necessary and proportionate recourse to uh, surveillance. So how do we, uh, behind the little uh, black box you, uh, you uh, would read, how to redistribute that information in augmented uh, surveillance, uh, how we can draw a new uh, uh, framework for fundamental rights. Well, if the answer is complex under uh, privacy and data protection um, point of view, I think it's relatively easy for lawyers, for labor lawyers, sorry, uh, because we, we, we are the branch of law that uh, historically is committed to rebalance uh, information and power asymmetries. And so in my paper, I'm, I'm, I'm simply, it, it's of course a, a proposal, but uh, my idea is that we should uh, shape privacy more or less under uh, economical uh, point of view and more under labor uh, perspective, meaning that we should strengthen the, uh, the, the, uh, the right to privacy with all the case law coming from the court of Strasbourg, um, um, highlighting how uh, it's, it's important to have uh, employees involved that uh, uh, trade union freedoms are substantial and, and uh, in all, all these case law, the Demir case, Narvi case, 
case which are, uh, I mean, it's few case law. We all know that it, it, we are unfortunate uh, uh, in, in case law for trade union uh, freedoms, but still I think it's time to stress this, uh, this point of view. And, and, and also I think we should stress under fundamental labor rights that we shall have uh, compliant to fundamental labor rights also companies um, companies developing uh, software and, and hardware. So if employers uh, have been found as, as uh, um, liable, uh, committed to uh, positive and negative duties, duties under uh, the European Convention of Human Rights as third parties before the court, the same, I think, shall, uh, shall, go, uh, shall, shall be also for, for software and hardware uh, developers. So, this is the final slide. So I'm, I'm, I'm here. Here today, I'm suggesting that uh, we shouldn't uh, erase the right to privacy at all, because of course it's one of the liberal foundation of our modern democracies. But I think that privacy shall be carefully balanced with uh, labor rights, uh, because all, today privacy is more shaped according to economical needs. Uh, pr privacy is seen as a, an obstacle to economical uh, development. So if we are trying to shape a sustainable uh, development of, uh, uh, of technologies, we should um, state that uh, privacy are, uh, and, the, and data protection are easily limited in an in a ever-connected workplace because businesses, again, as I said before, businesses, organization today are simply relying on, on, on this kind of, uh, uh, of technology. So we shall, I think, look more to, to the redistributive function of fundamental labor rights to ensure sufficient choice and, uh, and independence uh, um, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to employees and explaining and understanding then shall involve, I think, uh, as I said before, providers uh, of uh, uh, software in corporate uh, uh, structures. So uh, this is uh, my, my, my contribution. So I think we should Carefully again, it, it's the main point. Carefully look at, uh, mm, at at privacy as a rather liberal approach that shall be more balanced with a more public governance. And nowadays, it's not a, a case. It, 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 uh, not my chance. Uh, today we are discussing an uh, AI act, or we are discuss. There's a whole discussion on banning facial recognition. There's a whole discussion about limiting biometrics. Uh, we are discussing it uh, to ban some kind of artificial intelligence according to the new A AI Act. So we are going towards that direction. Thank you very much, Michele. Okay. Thanks so much. <laughs> Michele said before he start, I'm going to provoke a few thoughts. So we have stuff to think about. Uh, I will already ask Ilaria to come to the fore while I'm still reflecting on the explainability of AI. But I discovered that I already understand why I do not understand AI, so that's already a beginning. Um, Ilaria is presenting a paper that she wrote together with Chiara Gaglione, who will not be here in the room, but Ilaria Purificato from this foundation <laughs> will present research on a very, very important topic, also when we discuss AI technology, which is equality combined with digital citizenship, and we look very forward to the next 15 minutes. Ilaria, okay. please you have the floor. Thank you, Professor. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ilaria Brificato, and today I'm presenting a working paper that I'm working on with my colleague, Dr. Gaiona, who unfortunately who he isn't uh, here. Um, the progressive, no, okay. Yeah. Uh, the progressive digital transformation of systems and uh, infrastructure uh, on which the European landscape is based, uh, fostered by the advent of the fourth industrial revolution, is leading national and European institutions to take action in a, an a attempt to regulate it uh, with different approach and, and trends. Uh, the study uh, proposes some questions. The first one is understanding in, uh, if in our country there is a democratic access to uh, digital skills, starting from considering the obstacles to achieving uh, equal access among people. And the second one is understanding the potential role of social partners in matter of uh, digital training. 
digitalization can be an uh, engine for the sust um, sustainable development goals uh, as currently uh, declined in the UN 2030 agenda and for the economic and social recovery of uh, countries in the post-pandemic scenario. Uh, as all of us now well know, uh, the pandemic uh, has uh, speed up this process uh, toward digitalization and uh, in this context uh, has emerged a deep uh, digital uh, skills shortage, uh, especially in the South, uh, in the case of uh, our country. Uh, the issue uh, has been addressed by means of intervention and economic support provided, by, uh, provided in the National Recovery and Residence Plan. In particular, it is in mission number one that the document aims to give a fundamental boost to the recovery of the competitiveness and productivity of, of Italy uh, by focusing uh, on what the lawmakers define uh, innovation and uh, digitalization efforts. Uh, in addition to the recent measures taken by lawmakers and uh, legal uh, policy, we have also focused on uh, the position taken by the social partners. Indeed, uh, uh, the social partners at different levels, aware of the importance of the role of training and digital skills, uh, as much for the interests and employment and career, and career uh, prospects uh, of the workers, and uh, as for the productivity and competitiveness of uh, the enterprises, uh, have intervened on uh, the issue. Uh, the social partners are animated by the uh, underlying spirit that uh, better results in terms of quality and uh, effectiveness can be guaranteed thanks to a shared and collaborative management of uh, what we can define uh, uh, defines a training issue. At the European level, uh, what the parties uh, lay down in the European Social Partners, uh, Partners Framework Agreement on Digitalization uh, has a central relevance. In uh, this document, social partners outline guidelines for governing digital transformation uh, in, order to, uh, in order that it become an asset for all parties <coughs> to the employment relationship and uh, the risks uh, it can bring can be minimized. Uh, in pursuit of this goal, uh, um, a special section of the Act was uh, dedicated to digital skills and securing employment because uh, among the different dimensions of the relationship impacted by uh, digital transformation are also those related to the skills uh, and uh, in our case, digital skills. And this was especially evident in, uh, during the pandemic with the, the intensification of remote work. Uh, we have identified two key aspects of the strategy uh, proposed by European social partners. The first one is uh, uh, to design training uh, programs that are not standard, but uh, tailored to the needs of the enterprises and workers, and, and so the training can be effective and of quality. And the second is to have the active involvement of workers and their representatives in the design of such training plans in line with the intended purpose. Uh, in this sense, uh, so uh, worker, uh, workers' participation and uh, open communication gain relevance. Uh, on the domestic level, we have selected two collective agreements that stood out for uh, the way they deal with the challenges uh, uh, raised by digital transformation, mitigating the conflictual approach in uh, industrial relations that characterize uh, uh, the sector, and moving towards more cooperative rela uh, relations uh, between parties. In particular, we have selected the National Collective Agreement for the Metalworking Industry and uh, Installation of Plants. And um, at the company level, uh, we have selected the Lamborghini Agreement. 
Uh, although uh, predating the European Framework Agreement, both the, the agreement share its spirit informed to create programs that are receptive as possible uh, to the specific needs of uh, workers and companies. Uh, that are functional to enable the worker to remain in the labor market and to be considered uh, a human capital for, uh, for the employer, by the employer. And uh, uh, moreover, to recognize the participation of workers as a fundamental role in the design and control of training plans. Uh, thus, the, um, inter uh, the National Collective Agreement refers to a right to continuous uh, training and uh, imposes the joint planning uh, of the, um, through the is, uh, establishment of special committees to be set up at the various levels. Uh, the Lamborghini contract, uh, implement, uh, which implemented the National Collective Agreement uh, for uh, Metal Workers, states that the analysis, uh, monitoring, and proposal of the contents of training activity is discussed uh, in special bilateral uh, technical committees in accordance with uh, the method of work participation adopted uh, inside the company. Uh, an evaluation of the current state and future potential of digital skills uh, in terms uh, of benefit to both workers and companies uh, leads to the need to consider social factors that may be causing um, a digital divide. We selected uh, three of them, uh, level of education, geographical, uh, geographic factor, and uh, diffusion of required infrastructure to access the internet. Uh, in detail, uh, starting from the analysis of the data available at national level, we have first of all understood that these three levels are closely uh, related to each other and only, uh, and only repeat a condition already settled into our country from the most strictly uh, educational point of view. Uh, it emerges that um, only a small uh, percentage of Italians uh, declare to have high digital skills and the majority of them have a university degree. In addition, the gap between the north and the south uh, of the country in the spread of the basic and high uh, skills is repeated, as well as the case of distribution of uh, infrastructure where uh, the latter to be understood as uh, all those physical and digital tools needed to access the internet. Uh, while, it, while it is clear that there is a link between the level of education uh, of a worker and its level of digital skills uh, and uh, that the former in turn may depend on other factors, it is uh, equally clear that a circular process uh, is created that is destined to short circuit. Indeed, uh, higher levels uh, of education and continuous training tend to guarantee greater job uh, opportunities and uh, career growth. In turn, it mainly uh, mm, during the, wor uh, the working life that people uh, acquire digital uh, skills and uh, um, generally greater competencies. Uh, the result is that a segment of people such as unemployed and uh, young people uh, are at risk of remaining on the margins of the labor market uh, because they are excluded from this uh, process in which they can hardly integrate it themselves. Uh, and um, it is with respect to, to these categories uh, as well, uh, that the potential of the national recovery and the resilience plan uh, could be appreciated because uh, on the one hand it promotes a specific uh, intervention for uh, their benefit and uh, on, the, uh, on the other hand mission number five is uh, aimed at filling the gap between the north and the south of the country both with reference to education and uh, functional tools for a more democratic distribution of internet access. Uh, to conclude, 
what we want uh, what we wanted to show is that the intensification of digitalization can contribute to the improvement of national active uh, policies and uh, comp uh, and competitive competitiveness in terms of employment. Uh, Italian and European labor market uh, is increasingly uh, looking for digital skills uh, and the labor market relies on the entirely digital selection and placement pro procedures. As consequence, we propose to proceed along two directions. The first one is a uh, infrastructural dire direction and the other one is a uh, pro uh, programmatic uh, direction. In the first case, as you can see in the slide, uh, intervention should cover a variety of areas from educational at different levels to uh, labor sector to be understood in a, bro uh, a broad sense uh, and so in the placement phase and in the employment relationship phase. Um, uh, at the programmatic level, uh, at the programmatic dimension, intervention should be uh, aimed firstly to reduce uh, or eliminate the historical gap between different areas of uh, our countries. Uh, lastly, with the specific reference to the world of work, uh, in order to achieve a more widely and uh, effective spread of digital skills, uh, a collaborative approach among all the parties involved, uh, uh, namely um, employer, workers and workers' uh, representativeness, seems essential. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. While I'm asking Attila to come and take the stage, uh, I think uh, this is a very nice um, connection um, between Ilaria's speech and, and I think Michele's finding, because we need not only to, to train workers, but perhaps also management and supervisors in dealing with the digital tools in the, uh, in the workplace. And, you know, Attila is a fantastic negotiator because we negotiated that he has 11 minutes and a half <laughs> to respond to the three papers so that we still have time enough for Q&A afterwards. Attila, I'm very glad you can do this. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much, Frank, and I promise I will be, uh, I will be not using the 11 minutes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, especially uh, to the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to serve as a discussant. Uh, actually, it was a big pleasure reading uh, and hearing these fantastic ideas involved in these uh, three papers. And I would like to proceed uh, one by one and give some comments and contemplation on each uh, paper. Uh, and I prepared some slides. I will tell you why I prepared some slides, not because of my unnecessary lines, but I would like to show you uh, something later on. Uh, so let me start with the paper of uh, Burial and uh, Marta. We all know that nowadays there are many papers, visions, scenarios about AI, uh, both positive, realistic or optimistic. And this paper definitely belongs to the uh, very optimistic uh, ones. Uh, to my taste, it's a little bit uh, exaggerated optimism uh, involved in this paper, but uh, we are different. Uh, so this is my uh, first point. The second point that uh, the ideas, there are many ideas and uh, quotations from economists, political scientists, uh, as Frank also highlighted uh, in this draft paper. And all these ideas are very much in line with the ILO's new human-centered approach to the future of work, uh, the Centenary Declaration published in 2019. So somehow I miss a bridge reference uh, to this uh, um, idea of the ILO, and that's why I am using uh, the PowerPoint only, because I would like to show you this uh, very important uh, uh, picture and image uh, from the ILO, because all of these ideas, capabilities, institutions of work, decent, sustainable work, and so on, and te technology uh, for decent work are all involved in the paper and in the ILO Centenary Declaration, and I miss uh, some kind of a connection uh, between these uh, two things. Let me come back to the main point of the paper. To me, the main point of the paper that the authors would like to counter the mainstream public uh, image that digitalization comes as a natural force and there are no effective regulatory ways to influence this natural force. And they are very optimistic about this, as I said before, and they are heavily, heavily relying on the reflexive low theory and the social subsystems uh, theory. Uh, Professor Rogowski is here. And this is a good thing, so this is a very good start, but I would like to uh, formulate 
actually two uh, remarks in this regard. First, they are presenting economic uh, econ ideas of economists and uh, political scientists uh, on a, how to say, um, on a very simplified way because uh, they are taking for granted that uh, this post grow uh, economic theories and uh, post neoliberal uh, politics are really happening. So, uh, of course, we uh, read them in the books, but uh, the, the very uh, reality of uh, European policy making is, is, is very much different from that. So, I, I would call it a swampy soil for this uh, comparison and uh, communication between regulatory theories and this very optimistic economic and political uh, theories. Secondly, uh, not just digitalization is very fast uh, in the transformative effects, but these big concepts and ideas are also come and go uh, very fastly. Uh, just to tell you one example, we all know Industry 4.0, Industry 5.0, and uh, according to this uh, theoretical framework of social subsystems and reflexive law, we could have expected that uh, Industry 4.0 has exerted a huge influence on labor law in many countries, but this is not the case in my understanding. It is going very fast and now we are already talking about Industry 5.0, so again, these big ideas come and go, and uh, sometimes they don't have even time to uh, exert real effect uh, on other subsystems, such as law. So the biggest promise of the paper is to, to point out effective regulatory ways uh, for the future. Uh, and there are some uh, in the paper, but uh, I think it would be nice to give some more concrete examples about this imagined uh, effective regulatory ways based on these theories. The only one, what they are pointing out in the paper is the concept of risk-based regulation, due diligence. We all know that this is a hot topic nowadays uh, all over the world since the UNGP principles uh, 2011. So it is here with us for 10 years now, the concept of human rights due diligence, and I'm not seeing that uh, it has changed that much in the past 10 years, but uh, in that sense, I'm also very optimistic because we can see a trend of mandatory human rights due diligence regulation in Europe emerging. We all know about the Commission's proposal for a directive about mandatory human rights due diligence. And my question is that, is it a real potential, uh, or it's more like a dictated compromise of uh, big uh, megatrends of our lives. And the authors say that uh, this is kind of a breakaway from the illusion of the perfection of the law. Um, I think uh, in the first year of our undergraduate studies, we all <laughs> forget about the perfection of law and it's very nice to uh, uh, see that uh, due diligence is a different way of thinking about regulation. Uh, I share the optimism of the authors in this regard, but we still see that uh, due diligence is a very uncertain concept, uh, very difficult to verify and implement, and uh, most of all, the penalties, the sanctions for non-compliance with due diligence are not really uh, well elaborated, so this is uh, um, a question for debate. Coming to the second paper, Michele's uh, paper, which is less conceptual and more concrete about uh, uh, explainability and understanding of surveillance. Again, uh, explainability and understanding are very important uh, big concepts, but if we read carefully regulatory theories, we can also read about the downsides uh, and the backfire of transparency, because the consequences of too much transparency uh, can be sometimes negative as well. Let me just mention three points in this regard. Transparency is usually a means to an end, not an end in itself, so we have to keep it in the back of our uh, heads. Second, and this is the most important uh, point uh, for me, that the author, Michaela, is talking about the structural overexposure of the workforce to employer scrutiny on the one hand, but if we are arguing for a lot of transparency, we are creating, in my understanding, another layer of overexposure, overexposure to uh, information. I, I can just imagine a simple worker, what to do with the uh, 20 pages uh, explained uh, GDPR jargon of uh, the surveillance practices of a company. So I am a bit hesitant about the, um, the very value of transparency in itself. It's a good starting point, but it's just a starting point. And um, enforcement, will be still difficult. So even if we have transparency and uh, 
understandability and explainability, uh, enforcement will be still difficult and the rebalancing information asymmetry doesn't necessarily lead to rebalancing the power relations itself. So, uh, sorry for being a bit critical about transparency aspect, but um, this is my understanding. What I liked very much in Michele's paper, uh, these are the non-labor law aspects of the paper, because he's writing and arguing a lot about uh, the responsibility of providers, the third parties uh, in the employment relationship. And uh, I think we can go even a little bit further and talk about the responsibility of data science, the designers, the producers, the traders of this uh, surveillance mechanisms and technology. Uh, of course, it's not really a labor law issue, but more like a public law issue. But Michaela gives very uh, interesting hints about uh, this uh, direction. And I could add that maybe some kind of a human rights based impact assessment or a human rights based quality assurance could be embedded already in the cradle of this technology. So not uh, when we are talking about the labor law context, we are already talking about the outputs of these uh, technologies, but it could be uh, in the start of the process. Uh, let me show you very quickly uh, a very interesting case. I'm quoting this case from my home country, from Hungary, uh, because I think it's a very recent uh, and very symbolic case about uh, quality monitoring of call center workers. Both Tami and Michaela was referring to that, uh, and many uh, international colleagues was, uh, were asking me about uh, this uh, uh, decision of 2022 March uh, of the Hungarian Data Protection Authority. Long story short, this is the high, highest fine to date uh, I think not only in Hungary, but uh, uh, it's a very high uh, amount of fine. Uh, it's 700,000 euros on a bank, imposed on a bank. Uh, and the bank uh, was analyzing automatically the recorded audio uh, recordings of uh, customer service calls in a bank. Um, as I said, the long story short, uh, the authority found that the legitimate interest test was very blurred, was not proportional, and... Um, the company used the legitimate interest test uh, only as a last resort instead of the consent of the employees. And that was one of the reasons for the very high amount of fine. And the most important point, the last uh, line here, that the bank failed to provide the data subjects, uh, the employees and the customers, proper notice and the right to object. So this is the link to the explainability and uh, understanding. The last point about Michaela's paper, um, there is an interesting connection between um, consciously or unconsciously uh, between Michaela's paper and Beryl's and Marta's uh, paper when we are talking about risk-based risk regulation because Michaela is also arguing in some lines uh, about privacy due diligence or something like that uh, and I don't want to repeat uh, my comments about uh, due diligence. Very quickly about the last very interesting uh, paper. Of course, I don't know too much about Italian collective uh, bargaining, so I cannot go into details. But to me, uh, making a link uh, to the ILO's framework again, uh, it is dealing with one specific aspect of this big picture, lifelong learning and training. And this is uh, very interesting especially for someone like me coming from a Central Eastern European post-socialist country where collective bargaining, you all know, is very deficient and we don't really have progressive and vivid collective bargaining results on training and uh, digitalization and uh, on these uh, progressive topics. So uh, it was a pleasure reading these good concrete examples from uh, Italian collective bargaining practices. Uh, and I would like to make some very brief connections to some other developments on the international level. The ILO is increasingly talking about the rights-based regulatory approach which is needed to lifelong learning. And as I said, to countries where collective bargaining is not really functioning, it's very important to have a concrete right-based approach to lifelong learning. I don't want to bore you with the Hungarian situation, but in Hungary we have nothing in the labor code about training, further training, no study leaves or something like that. So we need some kind of a legal development in this regard. And there is one interesting development. I'm sure many of you know that, that the European Commission has just published uh, some months ago a proposal for a council recommendation on individual training or learning accounts. And this is a very progressive and forward-looking thing in my understanding. And let me just quote uh, another more conceptual paper on that. Uh, maybe it's worth 
referencing uh, also in the paper. It's from Mark de Foss. Uh, it was written many years ago, but there is a very nice idea about the individual career accounts, going a little bit beyond individual training accounts and arguing for a multifunctional complex uh, device to uh, collect uh, individual training rights, money and time. Uh, so this is a very interesting idea. To conclude in one minute, uh, or even half minute, uh, yeah, half, <laughs> two points that uh, if I have to identify cross-cutting issues in the three papers, you can see that these are the following two, the human-centered approach, and I'm referencing again the ILO centenary declaration, and this need or quest for regulatory experimentation and uh, due diligence. And um, I would say that uh, we should uh, argue for experimenting with uh, regulation rather than uh, experimenting with humans, with technology. So this is the way forward in my understanding. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, we started five minutes late, so perhaps we have five minutes uh, additionally, uh, past 12, for those who want to, to raise some issues and questions. I think it was a very rich discussion. It's like a tiramisu. So multi-layered, you finish it and then you still want more. So that's the feeling I get uh, also, Attila, with, with your remarks on this. So thanks for this. By the way, Belgium has in a draft act five days uh, right of training for every worker every year. So we'll see whether it comes about. But that's the plan based on this recommendation. So very, very smooth. Anyway, I'm going to see if there are questions. And I would say for those who have a question, raise a hand. And we are going to collect the questions. So I see there already one in the back, here in the front. It's like selling a painting of Magritte. Um, anybody else? Questions? Hands? Only two? Three. And a fourth one is allowed. Okay, we do it three. Please go ahead. Hello, thank you very much. My name is Claire Marzo. I come from Paris. Um, I would like to thank uh, the contributors for these beautiful presentations. Um, I have two questions. One is for Marta and Beryl. And uh, it has to do with the relationship with values and law. And uh, I would be very happy if uh, they could um, explain maybe a bit more as my feeling is that values are always incorporated in the law. And whenever we are interpreting laws, um, we have to interpret values. Um, the second question is for um, Ilaria. And, uh, yeah, um, and I would like to ask her if she could maybe define the term digital citizenship that she used. I think it's a very good idea, it's beautiful, but always uh, when we use this term, we need to ask ourselves, who are the citizens and who are the non-citizens or denizens, as we sometimes say? And um, would that be a problem? Thank you very much. Thank you. We, we go immediately to the other questions and then we go to the responses. So here in the front, Tammy has a question. I think for the people at home, they want to hear, Tammy, they're always interested in what you say. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for all the presentation. It was really fascinating. I want to connect and have a question to Beryl, but connect uh, what Michaela was presenting and what uh, Beryl and, uh, and uh, uh, Marta was presenting. I totally agree with you, Michaela. I think that labor law and labor scholars need to think about other uh, uh, actors beside of uh, the uh, regular actors designers, producers, etc., in order to change uh, the labor law um, framework in today's world in the digital reality. And this takes me to uh, a question to you two. You have a very complex and very optimistic uh, um, approach to the question of uh, AI and uh, influence of the workplace. And it's exactly because it's so ambitious and, and so complex, I was wondering whether and how you think we need to add those very important uh, actors, the designers, the producers of AI, and bring them back to the picture and, and make them also responsible to, uh, to the fact that AI can be positive for employees. Not only to, I mean, when we talk about the employers, it's only the end. Mm. Maybe we should start even earlier. Okay, Is thanks. It? Then the third one. 
Hello, uh, Camila Naumovic Beach from Poland, and uh, I will have two questions, but I limit myself to one because we have three Super. minutes for the discussion. Uh, so I will uh, ask Michele, uh, maybe in the break, to uh, I would ask him a question about the, the algorithmic management uh, in platform work uh, regarding his topic. But instead, I, I wanted to ask uh, Ilaria about the. Uh, the understanding of, uh, of the digital skills, because in the previous panels we were talking about the right to disconnect and we arrived in our discussion to the conclusion uh, that uh, maybe uh, for the enforcement of the right to disconnect, the, um, the part of uh, learning and non-legal non but organizational and education uh, would be uh, an important uh, uh, step. Uh, in the enforcement of the right to disconnect. So I wondered uh, if the digital skills that you were uh, um, examining and, and talking about also include uh, the skills connected with the proper use and the responsible use of, of digital uh, tools by the worker uh, and, and especially the self-organization of work that we, that we also experience now in the times of remote work. So generally uh, that, uh, that part of, uh, of digital skills that I study. So this is uh, something that interests me the most. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. I'm going to give the, well, to pass the microphone to Ilaria first, if we may, who can define the digital skill and the citizenship ID. Um, we have not a lot of time, so count until 60. One at a time you are responding at the same time. Difficult, but try. Okay. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, so, uh, we in our work paper use the, the, the term digital uh, citizenship to indicate a concept, a broad concept. So, we indicated the, the, the use of um, digital tools and the internet for all people. And so, it includes uh, um, it, uh, inclusive concept. So, we don't um, distinguish between uh, um, type or categories. Uh, we only refer to um, the, the possibility to use these, uh, these means. All right, thank you. Um, Beryl. Maybe you should Thanks. not argue why you are too optimistic because well, we actually, know we all are too optimistic, but maybe you could talk about the values first, whatever. Yeah, I will take a few together, So, but I will yeah. argue about optimism. So yes, we are optimistic because we want to look for new pathways and it means that we want to look at it from like a more positive starting point rather than all the problems and issues that we already have and know all too well. So that's our starting point. And then also, uh, we want to link it like also to the values, so this I will take a little bit together. Mm -hmm. Our starting point is that we want to think about AI as being developed for us and not the other way around, that we have AI and then we follow AI and we have to deal with all the problems. And here we want to use the values because the values should then guide us also on how uh, uh, AI should be developed, etc. So tell me your question, who to involve? Definitely also these kind of people. Um, and then more to Attila's points, um, the, the literature that we are building on, maybe we present it here a bit simplified to give you an idea of how it works, but these are not very, uh, um, these are not paper tigers or things that only exist in books. Actually, all of these are also already taking place in practice within the EU, within the OECD, within the United Nations, so it's something that could be the next move. And we just want to use that as inspiration for thinking beyond what we already know. So, and if that's uh, optimistic, we are okay with it. But we think it's also realistic and takes us somewhere. And the last point on risk, we actually want to move away from that, eh? from risk, risk re regulation. That's what we have now, that's what we see in the EU. With the new directives, we point to all kinds of problems and things, so it's maybe not a way forward. So we want really to make this uh, needs-based approach with a proposal approach that Kai Davidov worked out in this reflective setting that you also uh, indicated. So, but it's also clear also from other comments, we have a lot of thinking to do. So thanks for pointing out all these things that we definitely will uh, keep working. Thanks very much, thanks. Beryl. I have 
ask Michele to sit here to be quicker to give the last his few comments or if he still has uh, 35 seconds to use then <laughs> okay, like a, a general comment? Or? Well, you had some remarks from, from Tammy on, on the privacy uh, dimension. So if you want to comment. Oh, yeah, no, I, I, I understood that she, that she agrees. Okay. So, uh, okay. uh, no, but, no, but uh, the comments okay. of uh, Attila, uh, actually, I, okay. I, I do agree and I uh, um, understand completely that uh, there's a huge enforcement problem in my, in my, in my reasoning. At the same time, I, 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 I felt uh, this is part to be, to give some context, contextual transparency. This is uh, part of my PhD uh, dissertation and this uh, should be the chap like the theoretical chapter. So trying um, to, to, uh, to, yeah, to provoke uh, this, uh, this right to, to, to privacy that uh, we have, uh, you, you have uh, all researched, uh, researched in the past 20 years, uh, already from the 90s, I guess. I, 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 I do remember your monograph, Frank, from 1999 on privacy. So, but, uh, <laughs> and, and, and so uh, the, the, my, my question, uh, my real question, but it was too much theoretical, so I tried to uh, explain through the concept of uh, transparency was, well, should we probably give a labor conceptual, conceptualization to privacy? Uh, privacy being a, a liberal, as I was saying uh, before, right, so an, an individual right uh, shall be the channel uh, through which uh, imagine a new labor uh, governance in, the, in, the, in, the, mm. in, in this new kind yeah. of organization. So, uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Michele. I, bon I, want, I, want to, I want to close with saying that uh, I really love this audience. I have many reasons and I'm not going to tell them all. But certainly for one reason, you are so respectful and patient. So thanks so much for waiting until the very end and you have deserved a break. We're going to give it to you. See you later. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.